It's meant to be open, explored, pursued. It's made to be read, reread, applied, and used. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, with wisdom life changing to lead us on. It's made for guidance to teach us His ways, showing what's true, right, and worthy of praise. It's meant to be hidden deep in our hearts, daily examined as the morning starts. No greater glimpse of God do we have, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Let's stand together as we open our service with song. We're going to begin by singing all creatures of our God and King. Welcome to Wanda Creek Baptist Church. Glad to have all of you here this morning and those watching on our live stream platforms. And good to have all of you uh, back here as well in our auditorium and looking forward to a great day. Let's open in a word of prayer and then we'll continue with our services this morning. Dearly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. And I do pray you would guide and direct in every aspect of this service this morning. Lord, you are so good to us. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us to meet, the opportunity that you give us to worship you this morning in spirit and in truth, and we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name I pray, amen and amen. God bless you. you may be seated. Uh, we do have a bulletin that you can get. Many of you did not see that coming in, but you can take the bulletin on the way in. I think I have one there, and could you hand me that? Anyway, what we'll be doing is we'll be having bulletins. As you come in, you can grab those on the way in as well. I want to make a couple of announcements, and for those watching, I know there's a lot of you watching online as well, is tonight we're going to do something very special for our seed groups. Uh, I have a brief uh, kind of what Ann and Fred Ayers did when we raised our kids in the area of personal devotions with our kids. And this is what we did. We're far from perfect and as most of you know, we all make mistakes. 
But yeah, this is what we did. And then we're going to give some various people in the church a video or personal testimonies about what they do. There's no perfect way to do it. But I believe having personal devotion, excuse me, personal uh, with your family, with not only in you, but with your family is something we all should do. That's going to be our Zoom meeting tonight. It'll be on Facebook and Zoom. A little different than we've been doing in the past, and uh, we look forward to that. Ladies Bible Study this upcoming Tuesday. We also have next Sunday morning, you don't want to miss it, we're going to have an outdoor combined. We'll only have one service. It'll be at 930. It'll be outside underneath the pavilion. And uh, after that, we want you to come in here, and we're going to have a dessert auction on the screen. We're not going to have the desserts here. You can buy them. You know, not, the desserts aren't on the screen, but the pictures will be on the screen. And then when you purchase the desserts, you can then go downstairs and get them. They'll all be refrigerated. Better than having them all laying out here. That's next Sunday after the morning service. This is to help our teens with our, our retreat they're going to be going to in about three or four weeks. And the help with the cost with that. We normally do that for the wiles. And uh, if you can be, uh, number one, we need more desserts. How many of you like to eat desserts? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you aren't raising your hand? Raise your hand. Well, anyway, we want you to bring a dessert. So Mallory Spiker, my wife, or Jen Silman, if you'll see them, they will make sure we get your dessert in. And gentlemen, we want to have a, a competition over who will buy their wife's dessert and how much you can spend. And we'll look forward to that. Wednesday services are starting this week. We will be asking that you wear mask in and mask out as far as the auditorium, the children. We are doing that. There is a there's only about one in ten churches in Erie are open now. Just kind of let you know a little fact you might want to think about. And we're we're trying to do the best we can do. So if you'll just help us out and uh, have a good spirit about it, I know you will, and uh, we'll get through this. But we'd ask you mask in and mask out. When you sit down, you can take your mask off. That's fine. And while I'll be preaching in Ecclesiastes here, the children have a great kind of mini VBS program downstairs. And uh, the teens will be meeting up at Church of the Cross. You can drop them off at 6.30. 6, come back here and then you can pick up. It's a kickoff meeting at Church of the Cross. They have the facilities rented up there and we're looking forward to that. And the nursery, of course, is open. Lots of announcements today. And Awana Awards Picnic is coming up. We haven't had many that have signed up for that. And right now we're, we're thinking of maybe just not doing it if we don't get many that are involved in want the Awana Awards Picnic. But if you'll take care of that today, that's kind of like what needs to happen. But God bless you. Thank you for coming. And uh, let's uh, we'll take the offering right now, and then we'll have a special. Uh, Wendy Nelson we will sing our special. If you bring in, I know we have offering uh, deposits on the way in and on the way out, and you can give online. And appreciate your faithfulness in giving. Our giving has been at or above budget. Not every week, but pretty much every week. The averages have been above budget, and praise the Lord for that. I want to say uh, one of our missionaries, I don't want to mention their name because we're live. It's one of our missionaries in Africa. You think we have it bad? I want you to listen to what they're having to deal with. If they go outside of their house without a mask, they're arrested for attempted murder. This is in Uganda, and they're not even allowed to leave their home. So um, I don't think that's happening here yet, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, but let's take the offering, and uh, we'll uh, talk about that a little bit more later on, maybe. Let's uh, ask the Lord to uh, bless uh, the offering this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy, and I do pray for this offering that you would bless it. Thanks for those uh, that have faithfully given to get us through the last 15, 16 weeks. Lord, we know that you're the God that provides, and thank you for this privilege to give, and we'll give you all the praise and glory for it. In Christ's name I pray, amen and amen.
Let's stand together again and we are going to sing Christ, our hope in life and death. This is one we've learned recently and been working on. Christ, our hope in life and death. out while we're standing and we will be looking in the gospel of john our pastor has been continuing a series in the gospel of john we'll be looking at chapter six this morning john chapter number six and we'll be reading the first 14 verses the title of this morning's message is nothing is too big for god john chapter six verses one through fourteen The word of God says, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith to him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men set down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, in number about five thousand. 
And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together, and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained, over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. The Lord will add his blessing to our reading of his holy word this morning. Please remain standing as we conclude our singing with a hymn complete in thee. Thank you. You may be seated. Our pastor is coming in just a moment with this morning's message. Well, we're continuing our series in the book of John. And as we look at this portion of scripture, one of the, if you were to take all of Jesus' miracles, all of them, and encapsulate them, this would probably be the one, or one of them, that most of us are familiar with. We have the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus is not the only time that we had the Passover in Jerusalem in his three-year ministry. This is the only time he didn't go to Jerusalem. A year has passed between chapter 5 and chapter 6. Most of those of Jesus' uh, miracles and events are not recorded in the Gospel of John, but recorded in Mark and Matthew. But this particular, uh, this particular Gospel record then starts in chapter 6 with the feeding of the 5,000. It's a year later since he's left Jerusalem. He now has a strong group that are following him. 
His disciples decide, as we look in verse number one, that we're really tired. As they say down south, tired. We're really tired. So we want to go across the other side of the lake. We're not sure exactly where he crossed. Somewhere probably um, on, the, on the western slope of the lake near the city, modern city of Tiberias. He crossed the lake. And this group, can you imagine this, that was following him, decided we're going to walk around the lake. They didn't have a boat. So they decided to walk all the way around the lake. I've been there. It would probably be about 17 to 20 miles so we can beat Jesus when he gets there. Now, they didn't do that, but they followed him. They were a desperate group. You don't walk around the lake just for the sake of it. They got around to the other side, and just on the what we call the north, I believe the northeastern, mid-northeastern side of the Sea of Galilee, just on the western side of the city of Capernaum, there is a place, it's a hillside, been there. We, my wife and I were there, we were in Israel. They showed us exactly where they believed this was. This throng is there. It's now late at night, and Jesus' disciples are saying to themselves, hey, send them away. We don't have any food for these folks. And Jesus used that opportunity to prove that nothing is impossible with God. I want you to look at the verse, verse number 9. We know that this was a child. The word lad, we get the word pediatricians, what small child from that Greek word. It says there in verse number 9, there is a lad here, a small child which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? That is what Simon, Peter's brother, is saying. What are we going to do? We've got this throng of people, and we've got this little sack lunch, if you would call it, for all these folks. I want to preach a message I've simply titled this morning, There is Nothing Too Big for God. Let's pray together. Can we do that? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to gather corporately this morning. For those of here in person and even for those that are watching, Lord, I pray that you would speak to pastor and people alike. Lord, we know that nothing is impossible with God. And Lord, I pray that you would prick our hearts Convict our souls of the lack of faith, the lack of spiritual maturity on all of us in this area of our walk with you. And for those that are watching or here presently in our audience this morning that do not know the Jesus of the Bible personally, I pray, Lord, there would be a time this morning when conviction of sin would drive some dear folks to the gospel and them knowing that there's nothing they can do but Christ has already done it all. Lord, I pray that you would guide and direct, fill me with the Spirit. In Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. This text is a miracle of taking very little and using multiplication to feed a very large crowd, as most of you know. It shatters the thought that it can't be done. It erases the idea that it's too big for God. It provides hope, now listen to me, for a crowd and also for the disciples. It no doubt lifted up the spirits of those who were there, even though we find from verse number 14 they hadn't really got it who Jesus was, but it was starting to kind of filter down. It gives me and you an encouragement this morning that our little can provide a whole lot. So much here to encourage. So much here to apply to today. As we look at our culture today, there's so much animosity. So much anxiety. So much anger. All is done, even in Christianity, sometimes in the flesh. Where is God? 
What about prayer? What about love? What about our testimony? What about hope? There's nothing too big for God. Oh, I could go off right now on a tangent and a rabbit trail and talk about the virus, talk about death rates and how many people are actually getting sick and how many people have been sick and died. And we can, we can create all kinds of stories you want to, but I don't want to talk about that. What I want to talk about is the God of the Bible, the God that saved you, the God that knows you, is going to give us hope. Jeremiah 32, 17 says this, O oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and stretched out an arm. There is nothing too hard for thee. Psalm 147, 5 says this, Great is our Lord and great of great power. His understanding is infinite. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know that nothing takes God by surprise? You believe that? Jeremiah 33 3 says this, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Philippians 4 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Sometimes over the last 12 weeks, we have the idea, all of us, including me, that God is done with us. He's wringing his hands and wondering what we should do. The application, I believe, to today is that if you're discouraged, you're depressed, you're anxious, where is God in your plans, in my plans? Let me tell you where the Lord is, ladies and gentlemen. He's in the crowd looking at hungry, anxious, and discouraged and waiting for somebody to step up with a bag lunch. He's in the crowd waiting to feed you and me and comfort us. He wants to give us hope. And let's not fall into this fatalistic future, as I preached on Wednesday night, about it's nothing we can do about it, but, there's, but we know there's everything God can do. The ultimate goal of this miracle we find in verse 14 as it was starting to kind of work in. Then those men which had seen the miracle excuse me, which had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth that the prophet should come into the world. By the way, Jesus could have rained manna from heaven. He could have dropped quail from the sky. He had the power to do that, but he would use a bag lunch to prove that he was deity and that he could provide. Let's look at a couple things as we walk through this text this morning. Number one is the background, the background of the story. As I said before, if you look at verse number one, it says, after these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, and then he crossed the lake. You can find other references to that in Matthew 14, Mark 6, and Luke 9, which is the Sea of Tiberias. He crossed over the lake. They're crossing the lake over in a boat. I'm not sure the how far that is. I think the lake is not that wide, maybe three or four miles wide. I do know it's about 17 miles to walk around. Verse number two, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles. We know from chapter number five, the end of chapter five that we just finished uh, last, or last time I preached into chapter six, according to chronological time, there's about a year gap. About a year, not quite a year, has taken place. You can find that gap recorded in the other gospel records. So there's a, there's a large crowd. He's, he's down now in his, near his hometown, near Capernaum. He's on the Sea of Galilee, and he's crossed the lake. It says there, verse number three, it says, excuse me, verse number two, they saw the miracles which he did on them which were diseased. Now, the reason they're following him, when most people believe, is yes, they had a need, and many of them may have been diseased. So they're following the Lord, Jesus Christ. Verse number three, and Jesus went up into a mountain, that really is a hillside, and there he sat with his disciples. So he decides, we're going to go, and Mark has a great account of this, he said, we're going to go into the hillside, we're just going to rest and chill out for a while. But yet all these throngs of people show up. 5,000, not including men and children, I mean women and children, rather. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews was nigh. This gives you a time frame when this took place because the last time we looked in chapter 5 was right before the Passover, so a year has gone by. 
This is the only time in Jesus' three and a half year ministry he was not in Jerusalem at the Passover. Verse number five. Now don't miss this and apply this to you. Think about you when you look at verse number five. When Jesus lifted up his eyes, he saw a great company coming unto him. So that gives us the example. All four Gospels are recording the performing of this great miracle. This is recorded in all four Gospels in Matthew 14, Mark 6, Luke 9, and John 10. There's a large crowd, as we said, following him, that because he'd been healing the sick, he'd been attracting a number of people. Matthew 14, 14 says this. It says, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. The crowds were dodging his, which you know, they dodged his footsteps. They were eager to see more miracles, took note of his departure, hurried around the lake to meet him. The crowds were thronging about him. They were desperate. The Lord found a suitable spot where the crowds could eventually find a place to sit down. They seated himself and gathered there. They were desperate people, ladies and gentlemen. They were needy. Now, you, it doesn't take a lot of intellectual ability to understand one fact. Most of them were a long way from home. You don't go across the lake, follow them around, all of a sudden, oh, let's go home for dinner. There wasn't really a place to go to. They were sick. They were needy. Look, ladies and gentlemen, they were looking for hope. Isn't that what we all need today? Seriously? If you listen to the news, the world is over. In fact, I don't even know why we're getting up today. It's over. Adios, amigos. I mean, it's absolutely, in my 60 years of living, it has been the most incredible hijacking of the news cycle I've ever seen in my entire life. By both sides, by the way. I've heard stuff on our side of the table that is absolutely, positively, conspiracy theory, false, not true, and people believe it's true. And on the other side is the same thing going on. And I'm not going to get into statistics or anything like that, but I want to say this, the end result of all this, everybody look here. There's people losing hope. I was on the phone with somebody yesterday, a one young woman with children that is absolutely beside herself thinking, I can't handle this anymore. I'm, this, it's, I'm done. And where is Jesus Christ in all of this? I think of my grandparents that during World War II, they sent off their children knowing 20% would come back in a box. I think of my grandparents that had to go to get uh, vouchers just to get bread and food. I think of that. And ladies and gentlemen, as we look at this text, it looked like how in the world can 5,000 people be fed? And forget the five barley loaves. I'll go in that man, two fishes. That's insignificant that would some people look at like that was Peter was actually thinking that would feed him that was not what Peter was saying at all that was supposed to be given to Jesus to eat nobody in their right mind would think well you can't feed him this even 200 denarii or pennyworth as it says in King James no, could feed them by the way if you want to do an interesting word study I don't want to get off on a tangent the word 200 look at the word 200 do a Bible study on that Every time the word or the number 200 is used, it always means I'm coming up short. Even 200 would work. I won't bore you with that, but I always got had in my notes. We'll proof text that. They go, nobody really cares. All right? <laughs> so anyway, anyway, so I think of this. It reminds me when there was a throng that were following them, and they're following me. It reminds me my daughter and my son-in-law went to, they went to uh, um, Africa, and uh, Nairobi, Kenya, Kenya, and they said when they arrived at the orphanage, there was a throng of little boys and girls following them everywhere they went. They followed them. They were like, they over here, they're over here, they're over here. And I thought about that when I thought, look at this crowd. Not that I'm equating the same, but there was a throng of people following Jesus. 
That was the crowd. They were looking for hope. By the way, something that Ed Ayers and Fred Ayers were looking for in 1988, we wanted to go to a church to preach the Bible, not even being saved, and we were looking for hope. And we had just moved to New Jersey, and we wound up driving 45 minutes to a church we thought would preach the Bible because we were looking for something that we did not have. Number two, the balking disciples. Look there. By the way, don't get critical there because you'd have done the same thing. This, is, this ain't going to happen, bud. How many of you get skeptical and critical real easy? You get negative. It doesn't take long for you to get negative. Anybody like that besides me? As one person said, you hear a siren going down the road. You wonder who in your family got hit. You automatically connect the dots, right? Look what it says in verse number seven, though. It's interesting. Well, let's, let's read the last part of verse five. And then Philip jumps in. He saith unto Philip, now this is the testing. When shall we buy bread that ye may, that these may eat? Now, I, I wrote test next to him, and it says that in verse six. And he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip jumps in. Philip answered him and said, 200 penny worth denarii of bread is not sufficient for them, is not sufficient for them, that, that everyone may take a look. So we know on the surface, as they say, it ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. Matthew 14, 15 says this, when it's evening time, disciples came to him and said, it's a desolate place and the city is now over, the day is now over, send the crowns away, go into the villages and buy food for themselves. In other words, here's our solution. Everybody look at me. Just kick them out. Get rid of them. Throw it out. The initial response from the disciples were, we're tired. It can't be done. How about this one? They're annoying. Folks following us around, they chase us around the lake. We can't shake them like a piece of gum sticking my finger. I can't shake it, it just bounces back. I can't get rid of these people. Aren't you glad Jesus doesn't feel that way about you? Seriously. We all fall short. I've said this almost to the point of losing an authority type. Position, but I don't care. The longer that I live and the older I get, the more I know I have more to learn. I used to thought I had it all together. And some of you can look back, even at our ministry here, and say, wow, what an arrogant guy he was. But I know now I want nothing to do. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, we take positions on things that matter nothing in the sake of eternity. As one person said the other day, who cares? And they said, send them away. We're tired. The Bible notes 5,000 men were in tenants plus women and children. Some scholars believe the crowd could have been as high as 15 or 20,000 people. First, Second Corinthians 5, 7 says this. I want you to look at it. It says, it says, for we walk by faith, not by sight, Paul says. When you are hurting and hungry, there will always be those that discourage you. Send them away. They think you're a bother. We have that. I had a guy that worked for me years ago, and he was a pest. He wasn't really working. He'd show up. His name was... Vladimir Zvinsky. I think I've shared this story once or twice. And he would show up and he says, I'll do whatever it takes. So we made him a runner because he kept showing us. Hire this guy and let him just deliver between the three floors in the office building where he was a runner. And because of his persistence, we wound up hiring him full time and found out he had a PhD from Russia and he was there just hanging hot dogs and meet on the weekends just to survive, and we wound up using him. But the point is, he didn't just quit the first time he was discouraged. 
Let's look at the boys' lunch, number three. The boys' lunch. By the way, I know I've discouraged a lot of people. I'm sure you have too. I know there's been times when God was ready to do something mighty in my life, my family's life, your life and your family's life, and you said, just send them away. It can't be done. The boys' lunch. Look what it says in verse number 8. The lunch is referenced in the other gospel records, but this is the only record where it's referenced to be a little boy. It says in verse number 8, one of his disciples, Andrew Simon, Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here, just happened to be near Jesus. Right? There is a lad here, a little boy, which have five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Now, let me give you a little lesson about what he has there, about these five barley loaves. Barley was poor people's food. Barley is not what people of means ate. Barley was a food, the loaves were flat barley wafers, Probably no more than crackers we would call today. And it says there, look at the text please, it says two small, keyword, fishes. Now that's an interesting word. Most people believe they were size of sardines, maybe not even an inch long. It wasn't that there was any mathematical way you could feed anybody. In fact, most people believe that that barley and those two small fishes might have been muff for one little hungry boy, maybe a couple of mouse food for a hungry man, but it surely wasn't even close to feeding him. The stage was set for the miracle. It says there are five loaves and two. It says, what of them among so many? It's not going to work. But there was a provision. Andrew had been looking around. He spotted this little lad, Pedioron, boy, small boy, small. It's in the masculine tense, preparing to do something about his own hunger. This small boy had a lunch. Probably it was for him. He didn't, you know, we get the impression he walked in and said, oh, Jesus, have my lunch. He never said that. That's not in the text. He just happened to be spotted by by Peter, and he says, hey, how about, you know, or Philip, rather, how about this guy? I'm not sure they took it from him. You ever taken candy from a baby? I don't think that happened here. But whatever the fact, whether he donated the lunch or he gave it the lunch, he don't, there's no evidence that he fought it being used. Let me just say that. This little boy had come prepared. Probably his mother had given him permission to go across the lake with some friends to hear Jesus, we don't know. Perhaps Andrew said, look, son, you, would you consider sharing your lunch with Jesus? He brought the boy a small provision along with him. Andrew, too, had been doing some mental arithmetic in his mind. This would be me. I'm the Andrew. I'm saying, this ain't going to work. I mean, 200 denarii is not going to do it. Maybe even, I mean, it's just not going to work. By the way, we still got to go to town to buy it, and I know where they were. Capernaum was still a... a Going to town is going to take the rest of the night into the evening. You're not going to go to town. It's not like there is a Wegmans or Walmart on the corner you can go buy it with. By the way, how do you feed that many people? That whole region was not a populated region. There was not even 15,000 people within 40 miles of there. These people maybe had traveled all the way from Jerusalem. We don't know, but there was a throng of them. Nazareth, Capernaum. Corazine. We don't know where they all were, but they were there. The lunch. This set the stage for a miracle. The work, the, they were worried disciples. They were helpless in face of the enormous need. I don't blame the disciples because I'd be, I'd be saying the same thing. Just like they, when they had the miracle. Well, it's time to take this off, that's for sure. Uh, Well, that's not going to happen. Anyway, that 
the disciples were worried, but just like they were when they had the, um, when Jesus walked on the water and he was coming across the same lake at a different portion later on, they doubted it was him. They doubted him in entire ministry. So would I. I mean, that's just what who we are. We're not incarnate. We're not the Son of God. And there stood the incarnate Son of God about to demonstrate what can happen when anybody surrendered to God. I believe through Christ's miracle, the feeding of 5,000, God demonstrates he is big enough to shatter our finite expectations. Think about this. What are you dealing with today? What are we dealing with? Our expectations take sometimes God out of it. 1 Corinthians 1.27. Look at that quickly. I believe that up on the screen. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world, little boys with a bag of lunch. Can you put it that way? To confound the wise. The foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. His goodness, listen to this. His goodness exceeds our imaginations. Think about that. Christ amplified the meager provisions that were brought to him. And similarly, similarly rather, God amplifies our gifts, money, talents, when we bring them to him. 21 years ago, we walked into this church. My wife and I were still in our 30s. And we were told by a lot of people, our kids will never go to college, never graduate, never be anything, because this was not by people here, obviously, but others. And you just have to trust God. We all have provisions and talents and treasure that seem minuscule, but when they're multiplied by God, they can perform great works for him. And by the way, it's the little boys in life that help the cause of Christ, not those who necessarily have their act together. So we see here, ladies and gentlemen, look, look here, it's the boys' lunch. Lastly, the body that serves. Now, don't miss this part. We kind of, we have the miracle. They got to distribute it, right? Distribution is key. What good is Jesus providing everything if he can't distribute it amongst the people? Now, by the way, he could have just made it happen. He could rain manna from heaven. He could have had quail dropping from the sky. That was done in the Old Testament. But I believe he wanted those disciples. Now, don't miss this. Everybody, this is the end, so you now you can wake up. Amen. <laughs> I think he wanted those disciples to personally walk down each row of people, handing out manna, bread, and fish to prove to them, I am the God of heaven. And this may have taken a long time. By the way, 5,000 people, it's plus, I don't know how long it took, maybe hours. But we see that. And the point I have is, is the body that served. And ladies and gentlemen, we are the disciples where his arms and legs. Let's look at verse 10, please. And he said, make the men sit down. God's in order, not a guard of discipline. He didn't say, y'all all run up here and grab what you can. Now, there was so much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and look at verse 11. And when he given thanks, he distributed to who? What does he distribute to? The disciples, not them. He gave it to his servants. We are his servants. He said disciples, and then I circled it again, the disciples, and the disciples to them that were sat down. So he gave, he gave it to the disciples. Here's your big basket or whatever. And then I want you to go and do row one, row two, row three, row four, until everybody is served. The body that serves. I think this was a lesson to them. Surely the 5,000 realized it was a miracle, but he wanted the people that were surrounding him to see it as well. 
God uses us to accomplish something big. We are his arms and legs here. By feeding the crowd through the agency of the disciples, we see how God, how we can be used by him. Feeding the crowd, the God graciously involves us in his work, so we learn about trust. The disciples had to trust Jesus, that Jesus would provide the means to feed the crowd, and they could only give what they received. Now think about this for a moment. Some of us, maybe we sit, soak, and sell. We sit, we soak it all in, we sell. And we're never the arms and legs of the body of Christ. We just take and take and take. That'll sour you really quick, by the way, because you'll never get enough. There'll always be one little thing that you didn't get. Or just, and sometimes in Bible preaching, fundamental Christianity, there are people that just take and take and take. They're never out there handing the basket out. And then some of us here need to give some bag lunch out. I'm not saying it's through tithes. That should be done anyway. But maybe it's in a service. Maybe it's with helping. Maybe it's with writing a card. Maybe it's writing a thank you note. Maybe praying and say, God led me on your heart to... to to call you. If we look long enough, now don't miss this. This is really, I would say good, then it sounds like I think I know what I'm This is good stuff. If you're not careful, the world is all about you. And everything revolves around you. If you look around, I pastor a church, there's a lot of people that it's not good right now. They're hurting. If you, if you never take it and you never use the hand out the bread, the barley loaves, and the fish, then it's all about you. Now, sometimes, let's be this side. Here's what we put the other side. Sometimes we need to sit down and let somebody hand us some barley and some fish as well. And there's people in here like that, but they're never the one. Usually, people like that are the ones that always serve. You need to sit down and let people help you. This crisis that we're going through right now, in my humble opinion, and this is recorded, I may regret saying this, is really the defining portion of what a church is. Because if a church is about programs, plans, and everything meets my way, we'll show up. It really defines who we are as a body of Christ. If not, then we're just another Christian country club or a YMCA that has a lot of friends, and we throw some Bible verses in just to make sure it happens. And what we find here is the disciples served. Look, nothing hurts more deeply when there are no do-overs in life. Did you know that? You can't go back. The actions of life are sealed in history forever. A commentator, I think somebody said to me the other day, said this, everyone's grave will eventually not be visited. That's pretty depressing, right? Think about that. Everyone's grave eventually will not be visited. And we take God out of it. But there's nothing too big for God. And I want to tell you encouragement. If you've experienced the tormenting emotions, you're not alone. Here's the thing. Just where Satan wants you to be is to be down and it's over. Or we'll hunker down and hide and say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, please come. But I want to close with Psalm 42. Psalm 42. I want you to look at verse 11, please. The psalmist David writes, why are thou cast down, O my soul? Why are there disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Isn't that good? Oh, man, God is good. There's so much hope we find in this text, so much hope we find in the ability to understand that God can do anything. We just have to give him our bag lunch. 
and trust him. We just have to be willing to stop maybe some things we're doing and start doing some new things. My encouragement to you today is, I know there are people out there hurting in this room right now and know there's people out there watching. I want to tell you, God, if he can feed 5,000, he's not wringing his hands at what's going on in your life or mine. But I think we have to be willing to stop sending the people away and saying, God, what would you have me to do? On the leadership side, on the other side, and that includes moms and dads too, by the way. We need to be willing to accept that God is the one who's in charge. Let's all stand together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for this encouraging message this morning. Lord, thank you for the God of heaven that loves us, that saves us, and I pray this morning you would guide and direct in all of our lives. In a minute, Iris is going to play. We're not going to have an invitation when you come up front. But why don't you pray in your seat? If you want to sit down after she starts, that's fine. But why don't you get a hold of God? Maybe, just maybe, this entire message has convicted you about your lack of prayer. I know it's helped me. We're not praying like we should. We're talking a lot, but not praying. Maybe this morning you just need to ask God to say, God, get rid of this spirit that's discouraged me. The spirit that maybe caused negativity in my family. Whatever it may be, let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. I ask that you guide and direct in this time we have together in prayer. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. As Iris begins to play, why don't you pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this church service. Thank you for the dear and sweet people that attend here. And let us be humble servants of God that come before the throne of grace. And Lord, if it means a bag lunch, if it means trust in you in spite of what it looks like in the physical realm, let us understand there's nothing too big for God. And we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, God bless you tonight at 5 o'clock this afternoon. If you can break loose, uh, we'll have it on YouTube, Facebook, and on Zoom. We're going to do a, for those who have children, and even if you don't have children, how about having family devotions? We're going to have a, a, a little Bible study on that. Some, it'll be a great time. Maybe share that with others, and they'll be a part of that. Walt Silman, as most, some of you are new, you haven't been back this year for Sunday, will dismiss you from back to front, and you'll head out. That would be a blessing if we'll take care of that. And we'll continue this for a while. I'm not sure how much longer we'll be doing this, but for at least the next couple of weeks, we'll work at this. And uh, thank you for coming. We'll see you uh, Wednesday night. You can come here in the auditorium. I'll preach in the book of Ecclesiastes. I look forward to seeing you if you can make it out.